Just before we start the show, I want to take an opportunity to invite you to join me for the Podfluence Weekly Newsletter, which is available both on LinkedIn and through the official newsletter channel. Now, if you are on LinkedIn and it's easier for you to follow there, then please just click on the link in the show notes, which will take you straight to Podfluence on LinkedIn, where you can subscribe for free and get weekly updates on Podfluence articles as well as episodes. If you would like to subscribe to the full newsletter where you'll get additional materials and, as my little incentive to you, my pre-podcast guest checklist for you to use when you're appearing on podcast shows so that you can be fully prepared every single time, then please click the link to the official newsletter in the show notes. Hope to see you there. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to the show. My name's Johnny Ball. This is Speaking Influence, the show where we talk about the ethical application and the psychology of influence and persuasion in life and in business. I am joined by an incredible guest with an amazing story who, having been involved in a major crash and incident where she was very badly hurt, became a campaigner to improve safety conditions and that meant creating influence both in major industry and on the government level too. So if you are interested in hearing her journey to how she created a level of influence and persuasion at those highest national levels, you are going to enjoy today's show. I think also really is quite a personal story in some ways too, because there was a lot of things that uh, were sacrificed to make this happen. And probably untold lives have been saved it's impossible perhaps to guess just how many lives have been saved by the changes that my guest Pam Warren was able to help bring about the skills of influence and persuasion have always been important in leadership so much so that elites have often tried to keep them secret and out of the hands of those they seek to maintain power over and keep them in the hands of their own chosen future leaders. Whether you're an entrepreneur or a public figure, the ability not only to be seen, but to be heard and to do so in a way that builds trust and relationships is more vital than ever. Tools like rhetoric and understanding the psychology of persuasion are no longer only for political leaders and lawyers. This show's mission is to empower you with the superpowers of ethical influence and persuasion and critical thinking so that your message gets heard, your personal brand gets seen, and you elevate your ability to help others through coaching, speaking, products, programs, or whatever way you serve. From time to time, we even take a look at the less ethical side of influence and persuasion to enable us to defend ourselves against manipulation and to be able to recognize and counter negative intentions. We believe that ethical leadership starts with empowering and educating people and that the tools of influence and persuasion from Aristotle to Cialdini are available to all of us on a mission to make things better. You can trust that you're in good company where you belong. Now on to this week's show. Welcome to Speaking Influence, the show that helps you master the tools of ethical influence and persuasion with persuasive presentations and podcasting coach, Johnny Ball. If you're a coach, speaker, or course creator, and you would like to have a simple online ecosystem for your business where you can create funnels, build an integrated website, sell and host courses and live programs, build your list with lead magnets, manage your sales, create communities, and so much more in a way that is affordable and fully supported, you will love New Zendler. You can try everything out for free, and if you love it, you can register for monthly or discounted annual billing. Don't pay for multiple services that you have to link up manually. Get an online solution that does everything you need in one place. Find the link in the show notes and try New Zendler as the all-in-one solution for your business today. Welcome to the show and it's very good to be joined by my guest today who I've been really looking forward to speaking to. She's an incredible lady with an amazing story and I know you're going to love it and we're also going to talk about some really important stuff in relation to influence and persuasion that we haven't really got into on the show before. Before we dive into all of that, let me formally welcome to the show Pam Warren. Hello. <laughs> Pam, it's, it's great to be speaking to you. And we're going to introduce you a bit more properly to people. Now, a lot of people in the UK, especially people maybe uh, more our sort of age group, will probably have 
known or come across you before, and but they may not all necessarily realize why. Well, to explain perhaps why they may have heard your name before and uh, where they may have come into contact or seen you on the news before now, a little while later. But before we get into all of that, let me ask you this. If, there, if you could spend an hour getting advice from one person, from history, from modern life, from real or fictional, who would you choose and why? Oh, that's actually an interesting question, but I've always got my answer, which is one of my heroes in the past, which is Gandhi. I would love to have that sort of patience and to have that clear thinking. You can influence situations around the world, if not just in your country, by very gentle persuasion. I've always admired him for that. So that would definitely be my answer to that one. Fantastic. That's a really great answer. I'm great that you, you already had that prepared. You knew exactly who you would go to. Pam gives us a bit of an insight into you. Now, for, for the benefit of everybody who is tuning into this, give us a, a, a bit of an idea about, well, why we're here talking today, who you are and what you do. <laughs> My potted history is what you're after, isn't it? <laughs> That's the one. Yeah, so, well, people in the UK may remember me from the past when I start to explain that in October 1999, there was one of the largest train crashes in this country, just outside of Paddington, and two high-speed trains crashed head-on. I was on the Great Western train, and the carriage I was in exploded and burst into flames, and unfortunately... On that day, 31 people died and I should have been the 32nd. I mean, I was burnt beyond recognition. I didn't have a face left. I didn't have any skin on my hands. So I got rushed off into hospital where I was then in a three-week coma. And when my family were told not to expect me to live, so I should have been the 32nd person to die. But for whatever reason, and I just say it's because I like annoying people, I survived. And when I came out of hospital, I then decided to find out why the train crash had happened. It didn't make any sense that two trains would be on the same piece of track. Yeah. And that's when I discovered that there was this general idea with government and the rail industry in this country that it was cheaper to pay compensation than it was to make the railway safe. So I was so annoyed by that and the fact that we were risking human life that I set up a group called Paddington Survivors Group. I got known in the media because I had to wear a hard plastic mask on my face. That's what saved this face. And I went on to campaign and I campaigned for five years with this group of 81 survivors. We managed to get all the changes that were rec recommended from the inquiry implemented, which is why the UK train system is now one of the safest in Europe. Yeah. So yeah, that's the background really. It's an incredible story and certainly very glad that you are still here and not just that you're still here, but you have made such a difference for this. And this is really one of the reasons why I was so excited to speak to you, because you are someone who has put influence and persuasion into action. You have created a level of influence through this. And I think one of the reasons I think you've already mentioned it really was that you had this, not just curiosity as to figuring out, but it was really a bit of a, this shouldn't have happened and something's wrong here and it needs to be fixed. And that was something that was a very powerful driving force for people. Now, from that, you really built up uh, a big level of influence. And you said you started that with the group. Is that really where things started to create some impact? Yes. I mean, it was difficult as in we had to be stra strategic with it. I was voted the chairwoman simply because I set up the group, I suppose, and I was wearing the plastic mask. But I quickly realized when I was talking to the others that there's been campaign groups in this country as there is around the world before. And I'd never really known what, how successful they were. So I actually got in touch with some groups from the past from things like from the Irish bombings. That was one of the groups I spoke to. I also spoke to a campaign group from America as well, just to find out what worked and what didn't work. Because obviously mm. there was no point in us doing what didn't work. And I'm also a great believer in we could have gone out there 
and said, you know, jumped up and down and shouted a lot and said, how dare they do this to us and somebody's got to pay for this. But I didn't see how that would get anything to change. People can ignore people when you're jumping up and down and shouting. So I developed this strategy, which everyone else agreed with, thank goodness, where it very much was beginning to look at things from the other party's point of view. So, for example, with the rail industry, myself and a group of six survivors, we effectively taught ourselves engineering terms. We tried to understand how the trains operate and we learned about the new safety systems that were in the industry. So in a way, we became lay engineers. Right. Then on the other hand, on the other pillar, if you like, was the government. Because this country, every time something goes wrong, there's an inquiry and then out comes this report and then nobody really hears anything about it again. Right. And I've just got this vision of a vault somewhere with all these dusty inquiries on there. And I didn't want that happening with ours. So my idea then was to get the government on side. But I reasoned that one party does not stay in power the whole time. So they're always changing. Yeah. So we went cross party. We met with every single political party there was in this country to get them on side and get them to promise to provide the money that was required to make the train safer and implement what was recommended from the inquiry. And we managed to do that. But yeah. It would be hard to argue against that, really, wouldn't it? From especially from to take a public position that you were not against that you weren't supporting train safety, public safety, and really looking after the public for any political party is one thing that they may have people who are perhaps on boards or have connections to people in those in certain industries and maybe looking out for them or trying to do that. But in terms of being able to take a public stance, to, to have come out as anything other than for public safety, I would imagine would have been hugely detrimental to any of them. It would have been. But you see, they did try a couple of times in so much as when it first happened, the government very quickly came out and said, money is no object. Now, we all know when things quieten down that money sort of, sort of suddenly disappears and they tried to say they didn't have the money once the inquiry had finished. Right. They tried, to, and this was two or three years later, they said that the money was just not available. And that's when, because we were watching and I was keeping an eye on what was going on, I effectively had to say to them, if you do not keep to your original promise, then I will be standing up in public and all I will do is I will tell the truth. And that seemed to frighten them enough to then say, okay, we have got the money. So that, yeah, unfortunately, politicians, they do try to wriggle out of things because something doesn't stay in the headlines for very long. And we were lucky because one of the other pillars we went after was the media because I knew that without public support for what we were doing, we wouldn't last. And we actually managed to keep the media and the public interested for five years in total, which is why we achieved so much with their help and support behind us. Yeah. Had we not done that, it would have been forgotten about. And then it would have waited until the next train crash happened, which unfortunately it did. But that, that is in itself an incredible achievement to stay in public consciousness that long. We know, I mean, these days, the new cycle moves even faster than ever and things are forgotten about very, very quickly. Sometimes even the next day, but certainly often the next week, it's already moved on. Although there's even, I think even the new cycle is often used specifically to do that, to move people off of other issues that, that perhaps government and politicians don't want people spending too much time thinking about. And that was certainly happening then, but you know, now it's even more advanced and, and even quicker. But even then for five years in the public eye. Now, I knew when we first connected that there was some there was a familiarity. And when you start telling your stories, like, oh, yeah, I, I have some memory about, you know, I, I can remember your campaign. I can remember you being on the news. And I, I remember you being a very visible public figure at that time. But it, I would have had no idea. I think most people would have had no idea just how much planning was going into this 
and and that's what's really clever about this. Like, if anyone is really thinking about making any kind of real change right now, this is an episode that they should definitely be tuning into because you had a, a an incredible strategy for that, but also a very strong will for this. I mean, was there any way you could have ever let this? If I'm honest, no. <laughs> I am quite tenacious that way. Once I set my mind on doing something that I feel is worthwhile, I will keep going. I will keep going until I get a result. However, that doesn't mean I keep going down the same path. If I'm not getting the result, I do sit back and assess what's happening and why I'm not achieving what I want to achieve. And normally it just means a change of direction. You can normally work out another way around the problem. I haven't yet, touch wood, come across anything that's really not or has become unachievable. But I'm sure there has to be a stage when if I am trying something, there will be a time when I'll have to go, I've tried everything I can think of. It's just not happening. But back then, luckily, it was enough and it was a big enough issue that I was able to keep going. Would you say that that level of determination was essential for for making things happen? Yes, and I would like to think, and this isn't blowing my own trumpet, but I've got a very strong moral compass. So you just think to yourself, if you came across government and an industry that were deliberately doing things that were putting everyone's lives in danger, anyone who catches a train, their lives were being put in danger, and we were catching those trains with no idea that things were not being done properly behind the scenes. That sense of injustice, don't you, can't you feel it welling up? And that's really what also kept me going. I do, do, did not want and still do not want anyone to have to go through anything like we did back then, which is also why, although I've dropped out of the public sites, because to be honest, I didn't like the media that much. I felt, found it uncomfortable. Um, but I stayed in touch with the rail industry and all the time, I'm just sort of gently poking them so they don't forget. Because obviously, as time moves on, complacency can set in. Yeah. And you're, you're somebody that they don't want to mess with. They've already learned that. I'm, one of the things that amazes me is that there, there's not already a film made about your story here because it, it's so incredible. And certainly there are films made about you know, lesser subjects as well that are still very inspiring and empowering. I think your, your story is absolutely fantastic from that perspective. And I hope it does get told on a, on a bigger level in the future to remind people, <laughs> but just to remind people of what is actually possible when you see that injustice and decide, I can't let that pass. I can't let it sit. I have to do something about it. I, and I can and will do something about it. But yeah, I just I found d- it incredible. D- d- To be honest, I don't think I realised that I could. That didn't dawn on me until I was sort of getting towards the end. However, again, I'm a great believer in I don't care who the person is, whether they're the prime minister or member of a royal family, they are another human being. And therefore, that human being should be treating me and everyone else with respect. Just as I try to live my life by throwing or showing respect to other people. So... In a way, I was trying to get across my genuine wish to change things, not understanding it when people, if you like, on a higher level than me, couldn't, didn't share that wish, that they were more motivated by money, I suppose. I've yeah. never understood that. But yeah. as long as that you keep talking to somebody at, at a human level and remain genuine, but allow them to be genuine, you'd be surprised how many doors do open up. Did you ever imagine it would take five years to really see some change? No. And I must admit, because I ignored my personal recovery for those five years, I did pay for it afterwards. I mean, it took me personally 10 years to recover from my injuries. And I've still now, even now, 20 years later, I've now got chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. So I'll never get rid of it, but I'm learning to live with it. And I certainly don't let it stop me with whatever I'm doing. So yeah, it's it. What I paid a price. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and I guess 
all change does come at some kind of price. And that's one of the reasons perhaps why people sort of think, oh, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could sacrifice that much of my life. And and for you, it wasn't just sacrificing uh, that chunk of your life and your time, but actually your recovery because you were still healing and still trying to heal from such a terrible accident as well. That's a, a whole new layer on, on top of it all. But it really does show just how much determination could do. I mean, lives have been saved because of you and, and may not fully know how many, but you know that that's true. I, I know it's a safer system. So I am content that people, because there's nothing in life that can be 100% safe. It's just not possible. But I'm proud of the fact that the system is as safe as it can be at this point in time. And I hope it continues. And if lives have been saved because of that, then I'm grateful. That's all I can say. Yeah. I I love that you took a very broad approach to who you needed to influence, that you understood that there were decision makers, but you also understood that the public eye had to be on this as well to keep pressure on the decision makers and to keep the awareness around this issue. And you said that that was some of the lessons you got from some of the other groups that, that you approached. What? What specific advice did they give you on how to continue with this? Well, they didn't give, they didn't really advise. They just spoke about their experiences. And I have to say there weren't many that campaigned on a positive note. Most of them, that a lot of them seemed to be out for revenge. Oh, really? I can't really think of any other way to describe it. Some did want to heal. So they were more on the path of not trying to put anything right. They were just trying to, you know, move on and rebuild their lives, which absolutely fine. But again, I didn't really understand the psyche of the ones that want to revenge. And even when we were running, when Paddington Survivors Group was running, there were other groups. Sorry, my my throat. Unfortunately, because I took burning to my vocal cords, they sometimes dry up. Oh. But for example, there had been the Clapham train crash and the Southall train crash before ours, and there had been inquiries for that, and there were campaign groups linked with those. But they wanted to do things like, I remember during our campaign, that one of them came up and said, oh, we want to set that chief executive on fire so he knows what it's like. And I thought, oh, no. (laughs) And they would sit in the inquiry with the T-shirt on saying murderer. That, to me, is not the right way to try and get things changed. Right. And, and I think that's an important part here as well. One that I would never have imagined. You you really kind of think these campaign groups are actually working towards positive change. And it's very interesting to hear that actually quite a few of them weren't, but you made a decision that that couldn't be a part of what you were doing, that that wasn't the best way to get changed. I would agree, I, I would say, but I can also understand how perhaps when people are in the emotion of a particular yeah. situation, that that might be very hard for them to to set aside. And it probably explains why I've got PTSD, because I had to squash my emotions down. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do understand. Don't get me wrong. I do understand the revengeful attitude. It's just not me. And it wasn't the way that I wanted to run the group. And we were very careful. Luckily, The survivors that did join the group, as I said, we were 81 strong at the height of our campaigning. We all thought very similarly. And I think it's because perhaps the trains that had crashed on ours, we were all business people commuting into work. So perhaps we were of a similar mind, I suppose. But I always said when I set up that group, the success of this group will be when it is no longer needed, which is also why that group no longer exists. So I'm always going to be proud of that. So you achieve some very significant things with this. And I think there's a lot that people can learn from that, especially people who are into activism and into positive societal change. What do you think they can best learn from what you did? What advice would you impart to somebody who is looking to make a very positive change in the political and public sphere? I think, well, there's, there's a couple of nuggets I would check. Um, again, when we were campaigning, the internet was still in its infancy. So we had to work quite hard to get coverage of what we were doing. Now, of course, it's much, you know, it is huge now, isn't it? You, you can get on for all sorts of things. It would be important to 
I think strategy has to be the first thing. There has to be planning done if you want to achieve something. And when you're strategizing, you have to bear in mind that now there is so much noise on the internet and so much going on. You have to stand out in some way. I still think the reasoned argument is a good route to follow. And to do that, you need to be researched. So whatever your subject matter, whatever you're trying to change, you need to understand it inside out and know what you're talking about. Because that way, the people that you are approaching to change their mind, they will respect you because you are talking their language. And I think the only other thing is to know when to stop. <laughs> you, you can't make it your life's work to campaign and change things. You may, you may decide, okay, I've achieved what I can for that. And now I want to achieve something else for this. But that's the time you need to move on. And otherwise, your life will just become completely stale and stayed. And yeah. there's more to life, isn't there? That there's a time where you either move on or pass the baton to to somebody yeah. else to to lead the charge. In in terms of staying in the public awareness for all that time, what would you say were the key elements of that? What really worked in terms of keeping it in public eye and keeping people on side? Well, in a way, this sounds terrible, but for two years I had to wear that plastic mask. So, of course, it was then. A picture pa paints a thousand words, doesn't it? So the public sort of took me to their hearts because I had these injuries that required the mask. Once the mask came off, it was harder because my plastic surgeon did a brilliant job with my face. So quite often people wouldn't realise who I was, which is fine by me. But then we had to work a lot harder to keep the media interested enough that yeah. they would keep raising it in the public awareness. But even then, I think we were lucky maybe we were just in the right place at the right time. The public seemed to understand we were doing it for their benefit. We never took payment from anyone to actually run our campaign. So we didn't benefit ourselves in any shape or form. And I think that's maybe made us more believable to the public. Yeah. So you, you had a lot of conversations with people who were in influential positions. Did you find it was easy to have those kinds of conversations or would you often experience pushback? I mean, what were the sort of good and not so good bits of those sorts of interactions? The hard bit was getting the meeting, trying to get through either their PA or to get a date in their diary and calendar. That was really quite difficult. Although you just have to keep pushing. You just have to be persistent and keep going. Plus, I think, again, because I had quite a high profile, certainly in the early days, sometimes it was they couldn't afford to say no to me. <laughs> Otherwise, the public would find out. Yeah. So I think that opened a lot of doors for me. But once I was inside the offices, I mean, even when I was talking to the, the political party members, I mean, I, for a little while, I was up and down to the House of Parliament almost every week, meeting various. And they were, again, you got in a room with them, you started talking. Okay, you might not believe 100% of what they were telling you, but they were human beings again. So it was just like having a chat. So you do, you relax into it. You said that there was a lot that you had to learn about engineering and things like that to really get into this, especially having, I guess, discussions with the, the train companies and the engineers about making sure that this stuff never happens again. But were there any, any other things that you had to learn? Like, did you have to, did you have to learn some stuff about how to direct the conversations or how to get particular kinds of answers or move things in a certain way? N no, not, not so much that. I think. Again, because we'd researched what we were doing, the whole industry seemed to be okay about talking to us because, again, we could speak their language. Again, we were lucky because we targeted the chief executives and because of who I was, they felt that they could say no to initial meeting. But I think once we got in that door and in the meeting and they then spoke to us, they then realized that actually there was substance to us. It wasn't just them doing the right thing from a PR point of view. Mm. And they kept up the conversations from there on in. I'm trying to think, was there anything that, oh, there is one thing with the rail industry, which I still tease them about now, which acronyms, 
gosh almighty, I've never come across an industry with so many acronyms. Hmm. And there are some acronyms that are the same, but they mean two different things. Oh, wow. (laughs) So that we had to learn. And I actually still have a whole leave arch file full of rail industry acronyms because I still talk to them. I still have to remind myself what they're actually talking about. And of course, as systems on the, particularly on the rail safety side, keep improving with technology, I'm having to learn new ones all the time to keep up with them. <laughs> that, that's a really important part of communication in general, especially if you're involved in anything that's in public sector, corporate sector. Acronyms are very common. And you said there may be some industries where they are not just common, but they're everywhere and uh, maybe even overused and duplicated and the like as well. Uh, that, that makes things very much the case of there is their own internal language. There is a language that's only spoken really on the inside of that, that if you can't speak it, you're always going to be outside of that. So it's so important to be able to communicate with people in the way that they like to be communicated with and that they communicate with each other in that community as well. It's perhaps one of, Robert Chardin talks about this in the Influence and Persuasion book about people like people who are like us. We like to feel a sense of community and commonality and being able to speak on those sorts of same terms is a, is a part of that, as part of the, the seventh principle that he introduced in the new book, the unity idea as well. It's such, such a critical part, but, but I can imagine there must have been times where you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> really, really, I want to have to remember all of this. Five years looking back perhaps doesn't sound like a long time, but it is. It is quite a significant chunk of your life, and it's a long game. You know, I I know that there are things that I do in, in life that I know they're going to probably not have their fruition for a time to come, and I, I've experienced that with podcasting things as well. It's a very different thing, but knowing that it's a long game that you're in, I imagine there must have been some times along that journey where you're like. I, I don't know if I can do this, or I feel like throwing the towel in. How did you get yourself through those particular times? Yeah, the, there were a couple because, I mean, again, it's been well documented that I did have a couple of breakdowns. So it took a toll mentally. And there were times when I wish it would all go away. But again, it was that sense of justice. It, it was that sense of we've come this far and I can see the finish line. Um, I've just got to keep going. And I had a lot of support, not only from the survivors, but my family supported me all the way through it. So um, that helped. I also had a great team of um, medical doctors, et cetera, who helped me. They recognized that it was important for my recovery in a way that I, I got to get to my goal. But as soon as I got to the stage where we were able to check down and go, right, 99% of everything, all these recommendations have now been completed. It was then that I made an actual decision to drop out of the public site because by by then I was being offered things like, I remember getting approached by, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, people. And that's when I made the decision, I do not want to be a public figure. I do not want to be a celebrity. I want to drop out of sight so I can get on with my recovery, become a normal person again. But it's also why I still maintained my communications with throughout the rail industry, because as I said, I just wanted to quietly get on with making sure that they stayed on track, if you forgive the pun. So Yeah, I I knew I'd had enough after five years. Yeah. Do you think that you could have initiated change without having that level of public influence behind you as well? Oh, now there's a jolly... I don't know. I don't know. I think from a mercenary point of view, I don't think it would... It may not have worked had... I not been so severely burnt and I was wearing a plastic mask. Would we have managed to get the same attention and then be able to achieve the same? I'd like to say yes, but we would have had to change strategy. There would have had to be something else thrown into the mix in order to make it achieve everything else. That doesn't mean we would have approached the politicians and the rail industry, but because of our notoriety, the doors were sort of slightly ajar for us to push through they may have been more firmly closed against us. So I don't know. 
that is a hypothetical question. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Just, I'm just glad it's, that it's it worked out the way it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I wonder then if there are any shared some things already, but if there are any uh, insights into influence and persuasion that you think that you've had along this journey that might be helpful to other people. Definitely stay calm. <laughs> That, honestly, that is my biggest tip is to just stay calm. And I also found if you keep your voice at a fairly steady level, you know, no raising your voice, no dropping, no mumbling either. And you're clear and concise about what you're saying. That went down really well. That's something I've learned to continue in my normal life. The other thing I found really useful is if you've got a thought or idea that you're trying to articulate, write it down first and then edit it back. All human beings, when we talk, even me talking to you today, I'm from half of this interview will be lots of filling words and ums and ahs and, and bits and pieces that really aren't necessary for the message that's going sure. across. So if you're trying to make a very important point, write it out first. Don't read it write it out, but then edit it back so that you get it down to as short as possible to get your point across. That drums it into people's brains better and they remember it. The shorter it is, the more they will remember. Yeah, short and punchy stuff is is always really good. And the more we can take out the filler stuff that we talk about, and I know it's there, as someone who edits podcasts on a weekly basis, one of the things that I often do is clean up a lot of the ums and ahs and stuff so that it doesn't sound you know, too much like we're not so confident about what we're saying. And some people are much so worse than that. It's just a way that people speak, but we don't realize we do it most of the time. But in certain situations, it can make you sound a bit less confident about what you're talking about or that you have to spend a long time thinking about it or it just gets a, a bit repetitive after a while. But the reality is most of us don't hear it after, after a time. But what you do hear is those bits that come out with crystal clarity because they stand out that bit more. So I can appreciate what you're saying there. Like if you've got a bit of a nutshell statement that you worked on and you can push that out there and it doesn't have to be exactly the same every time, but you know you can say that and exactly what you want to say. That will stand out amongst some of the other things that we talk about. Yes. And I mean, it's something that I carry forward now in my career as a speaker. If I'm trying to make a point, I keep it to like one sentence long. And then I just keep repeating that sentence because people will forget all the stuff that I say in 40 minutes or 45 minutes. But as long as I keep making one simple, almost catchphrase, but it's not, it's not as woolly as a catchphrase, but as long as I keep making the same point in almost seven words, that will sink in and that will get remembered months down the line. Well, influence and persuasion seems to have got into your blood a bit because you, even though you stepped away from the public eye, it's not that you stepped away from everything in public life. You are still actively working and speaking, as you say. And so what took you on that journey to actually taking to stages and getting up and speaking in public? <laughs> yeah, that pure accident. Because after the train crash, once I'd recovered enough, I used to get asked to go to conferences and stuff to speak, which because I wasn't working back then, I was too injured to work. I thought, well, I'll turn up and I'll do it. And I'll have, I discovered that, and this is something that speakers don't normally admit to, but if you have enough of an ego in you, you can stand up and speak in front of the public and you're not too phased by it. And I discovered that I have that ego, not a huge ego, not with big E, but I've got enough put shirts bar to stand up and I'm not really phased if people are looking at me in an audience. And it happened to be after one talk, I didn't realize you could get paid for talking when I started. But in one talk, there was a professional speaker in the audience and he found me afterwards and said, why aren't you on the speaking circuit? I then discovered that there was a circuit, you could get paid. And if you honed your craft, i.e. I did a year's apprenticeship with a mentor and got your message right, then you could really make a decent living. So again, I don't want to be a millionaire or anything, but as long as I can put food on the table and pay my bills, I'm happy. And then from there, I discovered that 
Whereas people were originally booking me to talk about the train crash, the day of the train crash. I got quite bored of that. And also yeah. I didn't want to keep emotionally reconnecting with it. So now because of this weird aftermath, the campaigning, the recovery, all that sort of stuff, I learned so much that I now sort of wrap that up into lessons for people to use themselves in today's life. You don't have to be in a major train crash. Well, we all know, don't we, around the world, life yeah. is constantly chucking something at you. So the stuff I learned through my recovery and the campaigning are just as relevant today with any challenge. So that's what I now pass on to people. And I really enjoy it. I love that sort of light bulb moment in somebody's face if I'm talking to them in an audience. I love it. Fantastic. So give us give us an idea about some of the content that you're talking uh, about when you're when you're on the stage and what are some of the gems that you're sharing with people that well mainly particularly through the pandemic it has been resilience where you were kind enough to say earlier on that that determination to keep going how did I do it even when I was breaking down that's very much something I'm passing on now and the way I break it down into little tidbits and I view it, it's almost like ingredients for life. If, because resilience, if you think about it, if you just go, oh, I need to be resilient, one thing, that's really something that can get destroyed. Yeah. Whereas if you build your resilience from lots of different things um, that can all help you become resilient, that makes you much stronger. And that's really what I now pass on. There's a number of people in the public eye and, I could mention names, Piers Morgan being one of them, who seem to have this idea that people who talk about their emotional re resilience, people who are looking after their mental health and the likes, uh, just need to toughen up. They're just being snowflakes. They need to toughen up and just decide that they're not going to let that stuff get to them, stiff up a lip and all of that and, and keep calm and carry on kind of mentality. He's certainly not the only person who has that as well. That's, there's still a lot out there, but that's not what resilience is about. No, no. I mean, resilience actually is showing some of your weakness, not in a sort of, woo, woe is me, but allowing time and accepting that, or, that you are a human being and you are weak. You've got strengths, but you've also got weaknesses and allowing the time for the weaknesses because then the weaknesses don't take over because you've allowed them the time. I mean, there are times even now when I'll get a bit frustrated and tired with things and then I burst into tears for no reason, but that's fine. And I let it happen. And then after half an hour, I'll wipe my eyes and then blow my nose and go, right, come on, let's get on with it. So yes, my, my attitude towards people like Mr. Morgan is not that's high. <laughs> <laughs> he's, probably, he's probably not a fan of the show, so I doubt, I doubt he's listening in <laughs> or anything like that. But yeah, it, it, is, it is a very prevalent attitude that we sort of come across that that's really what it's about. It's, I think it's uh, based in machismo, what people sometimes refer to as toxic masculinity these days. So that, that's all about suppressing emotions, almost pretending like they're not there, that you're not supposed to show it, bury it down deep and just get on with it. And uh, and I know that that has been almost uh, part of, maybe part of British identity to, uh, to some degree for years old. Because we, we've heard it over and over again, right? But now the conversation is moving forward. We are talking about things like resilience in a more public way. We're talking about things like psychological safety now and understanding that there are issues that we haven't been dealing with. And thankfully, there are people like yourself who are out there talking about them and making them public for people. And there are people who are very much in the celebrity public eye who are having these conversations as well. Some of them are still getting ripped by the by the press and the likes, for sure, as we've been seeing. But the conversation is being had. More people are aware of it now. And I think that's very beneficial. What my take on a lot of the mental resilience stuff has come from my interest in Stoic philosophy. And that I found that very helpful because it really just helps me to present things to myself in a way that is realistic about what is actually going on with the world, not just feeling sorry for myself about it, but accepting how things are and understanding that how people are, how the world is, and doing my best each day 
regardless of all those things. And, and that really is what it's about. It's about what you can influence, what you can change for yourself and in, in your life and your world, rather than what you can't. And I guess a lot of what we've talked about today, a lot of your story is, is very much the embodiment of that. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. And you've also got to remind yourself, it takes all sorts to make the world go round. <laughs> So yeah, there'll, there'll be people there that we won't understand and there'll be them that don't understand us. But I think if we could keep that humanity for each other and just accept that we're all different in some ways, but we're all the same in lots of ways, I think the world would probably be a much nicer place. I, I think so. And, and I hope that we can all find the same kind of resilience to, that you've demonstrated in your life and in your story as well. And I think I don't think anyone could really listen to your story and listen to this episode without taking away some inspiration from that, Pam. I think you're amazing. So oh, thank, you, thank you for sharing all of that with us. We do need to start wrapping things up, unfortunately, but uh, this has been a real joy. One thing that's really important, and people who watch on the screen can probably <laughs> probably see how to contact you right now but people who may be listening in what's the best way for them to get in touch with you yes if they go onto my website then there is a contact form there which does drop into my inbox it does go through my pa because she gets annoyed by <laughs> like, <laughs> the amount i keep taking on but i always try where i can to get back to people personally and if you google me yeah i'll pop up quite high up on the first page I'm afraid but yeah they can get in contact with me there but I love hearing from people and I always like to hear other people's stories as well because I think it doesn't matter that there's people out there that think they haven't done much with their lives but they have really if they get an opportunity to speak about it they have they've made a difference too people always underestimate their own stories you know i had a guest on a while back on very early on in my show his name is matthew dix i've mentioned him on several shows since then as well he's pretty much a professional storyteller and teaches storytelling as well and has won mountains of competitions about storytelling too and one of the things that, that he was talking about that was that people think they don't have stories they don't think their stories are important but if you actually do start taking the time to write stuff down or you start letting yourself find some cues for story writing, that best thing that ever happened or worst thing that ever happened, you start finding you have all this stuff, this material that's important. It's your life, it's your story that you could be talking about and helping other people with as well. So yeah, fantastic stuff, Pam. So for people who want to come check you out, pamwarren.co.uk is your website. For every guest I have on the show, I like to ask, the question, the only recurring question I really have is for a, a book recommendation. And I do allow, I do allow two. So what would your book recommendation be? It might be related to some of the subjects we talked about or just books that you found really useful or impactful, but what would you choose? Oh, now you didn't warn me about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm naughty. I, there's one book that did have a huge impact on me recently which is that book by Matthew Walker, Why, Why We Sleep, only because I do still suffer from insomnia every now and then. Once I understood some of the stuff that was going on and why we do sleep, absolutely fascinated. And it explained a lot. And I have changed my sleep hygiene, which has improved my sleep no end. And for, I think, because I always like a bit of escapism as well. But then I don't suppose anyone wants to hear about Russian literature, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I, I'm always amazed. But I think if there's a book that you particularly, you know, you fell in love with, you just think, I don't know if everyone would read it, but maybe they should. What, what would that be? Well, you see, I'm a great, oh, this is going to sound so pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> but War and Peace was definitely one of my seminal books. And it's a book I keep on returning to. And I think I must have been in a previous life, been a Russian. Um, but also, I mean, I've been to Russia on a visit and I got to see some of the places where some of the events happened. So I just love all that sort of historical stuff. Tolstoy is one of those people that everyone wishes they'd read or people claim to have read, but not everybody has, right? But it's a seminal work for a reason. Uh, I think it's a, a great recommendation, Pam. As we do draw things to a close, if there's just one thing that you hope that people will take away, and I'm sure it'll be more than one, but just one thing that people take away from this conversation today, what would you hope that that is? I hope it would be believe in yourself. You are definitely stronger than you think. 
That's a great lesson to end on, Pam. A great share. It has been such a delight talking to you. I knew it would be. I knew this was going to be an amazing episode. Your story is fantastic. I've enjoyed every minute of it. I hope we can have you back again in the future. I'd love to, Johnny. And I hope you have a nice rest of the day. Thanks, Pam. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you have enjoyed the show. If you have, please make sure you are subscribed for future episodes. And whilst you're here, if you're on Apple Podcasts or listen on Podchaser, then please do think about leaving us a review. Let us know where you might like to see some improvements, who you might like to see on the show, and if we're doing a good job or could make the show even better for you. In order to help us grow the show, your reviews certainly help, and so does sharing the show out with your network. And if you would like to support the show financially, you can do that for as little as five US dollars a month from the Supercast page that you'll find in the show notes. I hope you have enjoyed the audio improvements this week with my brand new studio microphone. It's going to take a while for that to come out in the episodes as well, but please know that it is your support of the show that enables me to keep making improvements to audio quality and to the production levels of the show, making Speaking Influence hopefully an even more enjoyable podcast to listen to. For now, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, have an amazing rest of your day. Go and make great things happen. See you next time on Speaking Influence.